All right. Must say, I'm quite impressed. All four of us made it to the panel today, this morning, oh. considering three out of four of us last night has um, had a bit of a bender. Yeah, what time did you get home, Butch? <laughs> did you guys have a good time? <laughs> I, was, I, was I don't remember. Arthur's, yeah. <laughs> Arthur's party. Yeah. Um, yeah, my name's Sylvia Tara. I am the head of partnerships and research at Bullish Exchange. Joining me today, we have Mike Vicella from Neo Classic Capital. We've got Matt Siegel from Van Eck, as well as Ben Roth from Oros. So without further ado, I'll let the panelists do a brief introduction of themselves, starting with Mike. Yep, so Mike Vichella, managing partner of Neo Classic Capital, a one week old to the public investment firm. I had started another firm with my partners previously called Block Tower Capital. Uh, so I've been in the crypto investment space for seven years professionally. I uh, spent 10 years at Goldman prior to that, and I'm on the board of a power company um, that does hydro and nuclear Bitcoin mining, uh, and now some HPC, given the AI revolution. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. Great to, great to be here in Dubai. Uh, I run the digital assets research at VanEck. VanEck is a $100 billion asset manager. We have about $1.5 billion in crypto assets across ETFs and actively manage liquid token funds. I started my career as a journalist, uh, understood the phenomenon of fake news pretty early, uh, moved to the buy side, uh, managed an equity portfolio with Kathy Wood uh, at Alliance Bernstein, uh, got a lot of conviction in how to uh, identify disruptive technology, but also learned a few things I didn't want to do, like overtrade a portfolio. Uh, so I'm at VanEck running a low turnover, buy, stake, risk manage collection of digital assets. Uh, we've also got a stablecoin project that Jan's son is running and an NFT platform uh, run out of Germany. Uh, ben Roth, uh, co-founder and uh, CIO at Oros, where a uh, electronic trading and market making firm focused entirely on, on crypto assets. Uh, founded the firm in 2019. Prior to that, I spent my career as an equity derivatives trader and a macro portfolio manager at a number of prop firms in throughout the world, really, predominantly Asia and the United States. Um, we have 85 people at Oros, of which I think um, 70 of us are, are in, in the country. Um, well, 70 tried to get in the country. I think there's a few still trying to get in after some transportation issues this week. Uh, company has five major business lines. We've got our um, electronic trading business, which is uh, high frequency and medium frequency trading. Uh, we've got a DeFi desk, an options desk. Uh, we do strategic market making on behalf of token projects and exchanges, and also Oros Ventures, which is a relatively new um, new project that we've uh, that we've started started deploying um, to strategic um, enterprises and and projects, and we're looking to expand that throughout this year and, and going forward. Thank you. Thanks for that. Okay, so let's start the panel off with the first question about business cycles. So if you look at a graph of what a business cycle looks like, it's the trough, and then there's an expansionary period, you reach the peak, and then a recessionary or contractionary period, and you're back at the trough. So which part of the market cycle do you feel that we're in today? Maybe we'll start with Mike. Uh, sure. So, I, I mean, I think we're clearly in an expansionary phase. It's, um, I guess it's been affected by two major things, which has been interest rates shifting higher, um, counterbalance with the ETFs. There's a bug on my face. Thank you at Van Eck and the other providers of ETFs. So I think that's kind of impacted the typical four-year cycle in crypto. Post-2020, it was all about liquidity. And uh, I got a fly getting in my face here. Um, and uh, and I think that unleashed, last night. Yeah, it unleashed um, a lot of liquidity into the market. A lot of that flowed into long tail risk assets, including crypto. Um, we're at, I mean, we're, we're, we're trading north of 60,000. I know near term that feels like a hit to the market depending on your time frame. Uh, I had the gift and the curse of running both a hedge fund and a venture fund in crypto. And so I look at things in multiple time frames. Um, I always judge these conversations by what I would tell my mother, which is, you know, accumulate at this point. Um, don't go crazy. I feel like we don't know what's going to... There's obvious geopolitical geopolit events that are happening at this current moment that could impact risk markets. And right now, the only thing working is gold, oil, and, uh, and rates. So 
Um, we're in expansionary phase. I think technologically, we're in a very interesting time. Um, and that's kind of what we're focused on at, at, at the moment at Neo Classic, which is identifying founders that are building infrastructure and applications uh, that people will use, uh, which I think over the year we've always speculated on for a long time. Um, but usability of product is getting a lot better. Uh, and then identifying the regions in the world where those users are, which the US is not that helpful with at the moment. So um, I'll pause there. I'll move over to you. Yeah, so I mean, I think we, there's, you can think about cycles in the short term business cycle, but then there's also longer cycles to think about. Uh, and so our call is that we had a 40 year cycle of great moderation of falling interest rates, globalization, and lower resource prices. And you know, Satoshi kind of, I think, anticipated uh, the turn in that cycle. And now we're in a period of fiscal dominance. It's a long-term cycle when government monetary policy is just less effective because of the high levels of, of debt. And the, the three factors that underpin the great moderation have all reversed. So now we've got deglobalization and rising rates and rising resource prices. And that means that a lot of correlations that used to hold uh, may be decoupling. Uh, and we think that Bitcoin and, and digital assets are well set up for that period of uh, fiscal dominance, right? Uh, on the short term cycle, PMIs spent 2023 all in contractionary period, you know, under 50 on global PMI. And now in March 2024, it's above 50. Uh, China manufacturing is accelerating. Um, but we still have this uh, fiscal reckoning that has to be dealt with. Uh, and I think that's going to be the challenge uh, for investors over the next year. OK. And Ben? You guys are better macro guys than I am, I would say. Um, I, I repeat what they say, fairly uncontroversial. Um, Consensus view, uh, it's going to become a fiscal, fiscally dominated space, um, global macro. You've had this kind of, uh, I would add demographics as well to, to um, what uh, Matt said. Um, you've, got, you've got weakening demographics or at least weakened demographics in a number of, number of nations. So I think going forward on the, on the larger cycle, definitely become more fiscal um, dominant. Um, it feels like... It feels like we're probably at the top of the short-term cycle of, of rates globally, although inflation still still hasn't weakened, so that, that, that story's still not yet to be told. I think in terms of crypto, uh, penetration of technology globally, so we talk about like mobile phone penetration, but I, I just penetration of kind of information globally has, has increased significantly in the past decade. I think that's a, it's a very strong tailwind for, for crypto as well as... Uh, geographical, uh, geopolitic, sorry, geopolitical um, kind of instability across nations drives at least a, a demand for for some sort of stable global currency, of which Bitcoin's probably a probably a major beneficiary. Okay, so it's like expansionary, long-term expansionary, and then on the upward trend with momentum there. So um, I heard a talk um, from Kathy Wood. A two weeks ago back in Hong Kong. So she dialed in to the conference there. And uh, there was this concept that Bitcoin was both a risk on and risk off asset. So what she meant by risk on was, you know, it's highly correlated to US equity markets. As we know we've seen like over 0 0.8 since uh, the outbreak of COVID and then risk off in the sense that when you look at developing nations with hyperinflation, there is a flight to safe haven assets like Bitcoin. And for things like financial meltdowns, like what we saw in SVB um, back in March 2021, that sent Bitcoin's price action up by 40%. So, you know, there's that argument of risk on and risk off. Can an asset class be that versatile? Uh, what, what do you guys think? Maybe we'll start with Matt. Uh, well, as usual, I disagree with Kathy, which is why I don't uh, work with her anymore. <laughs> uh, you know, the long-term correlation of Bitcoin is, is essentially zero uh, with risk assets. But 
uh, Bitcoin's still a teenager, so its correlations uh, change over time. It's mainly so, driven by liquidity, though, right, in the that short term. Sure. But I, I just think of it as a way to get exposure to emerging markets and frontier markets. And U.S. institutional investors you know, used to buy emerging market stocks. They were f that index is 40% Chinese. Uh, we've seen how China uh, uh, has changed dramatically in the last 10 years, and it's essentially become uninvestable for lots of U.S. institutional investors. And so they can and will look to Bitcoin and digital assets as a way to get exposure to these frontier markets. And we have some long-term conviction in that because you can look at surveys of citizens by country, whether they're optimistic or pessimistic on Bitcoin. And the, 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 the countries that are most optimistic are you know, Nigeria, the Philippines, um, uh, country, young countries, essentially. And the countries that are most pessimistic on Bitcoin are Japan, France, Germany, the old countries. Uh, so we just look at the demographic writing on the wall uh, and, and don't see it as either risk on or risk off. Okay. And Ben? Yeah, I agree. Long term, low correlation, short term. Highly correlated, but most assets are fairly highly correlated in the short term. You know, liquidity flows, um, particularly interest rates, um, commentary, macro commentary by Fed and regulatory agencies tends to drive all assets in the short term. But in the long term, yeah, I, I would agree. It's, it's highly uncorrelated to, to other asset classes, and that's kind of what we've seen um, from, from the data. Okay. I mean, it, it kind of all depends on what your denomination is. Like, yeah. Bitcoin's trading at all-time highs in a number of, of, of particularly emerging market currencies. And, you know, yeah. so, I don't know. I view everything in life as a pair trade, right? We're sitting up here instead of standing somewhere else, right? That's a pair trade. We're long this stage versus short another stage, right? And so when you're long Bitcoin, you're short something. You're selling something to buy Bitcoin. And typically, when you're in a region where there's, I don't know, poorly run uh, monetary policy, you want to be out of that denomination. You want to be in something like Bitcoin, or you want to be in the US dollar, uh, or you want to be in Miami real estate, right? It's uh, a lot of Latin American, I'm, I live in Miami now, so I'm using this reference, but a lot of Latin American wealth has flowed into US denominated, US dollar denominated Miami real estate. I mean, it's, it's all about how can I get myself into a more stable environment? Bitcoin is, it's been touted as the hardest of hard assets. I, I, I think I generally agree with that. I, I, like, there's definitely fault in that um, slightly, but it's better than most things. Uh, is it better than the US dollar? In time, probably. At the moment, no, because it's not as functional. Um, so I guess it all depends on, it's, I wouldn't necessarily call it risk off, because it certainly hasn't acted risk off, but it is a de-risking agent if you live in a region with very poor monetary policy. And the worst part is, those governments tend to try and control the monetary supply in such a forceful way that they make it the most, so Nigerian, I don't know if it's the citizens that are most positive on it, but the government clearly is trying to do everything they can to preserve their Nigerian Naira, right, I believe it is. So... They're pushing CBDCs over there. And yeah, so, I mean, everything comes down to preservation of purchasing power, preservation of power, which is through your currency typically, and that's what the US has always done throughout its history, and I feel like it's what most countries do, but citizens are the ones that kind of are gonna be the, the driving change agent in some of those regions, and, and in the US. And yeah. like one correlation which has been quite pronounced and sticky is Bitcoin's negative correlation to the U.S. dollar, which is kind of intuitive. A Bitcoin is kryptonite to the dollar, um, and emerging market equities also used to act best when the dollar was weak, right? So I think that that further supports our thesis that it's an increasingly a emerging market, frontier market proxy. And if you look at the performance of emerging market debt, even local denominated EM debt has outperformed US investment grade over the last two years, which is a big change, and we think speaks to the better, uh, more responsible monetary and fiscal policy that's being run in emerging markets versus mm. many developed markets right now. Okay, fair play. Um, let's move on to market makers. So I know there's probably a few projects sitting in the audience today, and Ben, coming from a market making firm, the industry is quite saturated, right? There's so many market makers out there, and 
you know, as a, a token project, you don't know which one to go through and what, what are the key characteristics that you would say token projects should look out for when they're looking for a market maker and also like what differs you guys from other market makers? What's your real moat out there? Yeah, there, there is a lot of uh, misinformation out there. Um, kind of the, the, I see a few market makers in the room, see one in the front row here. <laughs> um, and he would probably agree with me. A lot of misinformation, the term market making, quote unquote, is kind of bandied around by probably hundreds of firms in the space. And there's, there's probably a fr only a fraction of those that, that really understand what, what liquidity provision actually is. Um, you, you, you spoke about you know, what, what should projects look for. I think, I think the most important thing when, you are, when you're selecting a market maker or, or, or you're thinking about a liquidity um, strategy as a firm or as a project, don't get caught up with kind of some of the little shiny balls and fluffy toys attached to the liquidity provision. Um, the most important thing a market maker can provide is consistent, ongoing, guaranteed liquidity on exchange, be it you know centralized exchange or a decentralized exchange, during during all market periods, all market cycles. So it's very easy it's very easy to kind of provide two mark, two way liquidity when volatility is low and liquidity is deep. It's it's easy to add your liquidity onto it and say, hey, we're quote unquote market making. What is difficult is when there is no natural liquidity, when the market is volatile and that is often the case on new launches, particularly on launch day and, and in the, say, few days or weeks post-launch. And, and it's in those conditions that you really find out you know, who, who's a quality market maker and, and who isn't. And I think um, in, terms of, in terms of launches, in terms of what, what projects should look for on launch day or, or, or soon after launch day, I think it takes, we like to say it takes at least a month, but sometimes you know, two, three months to plan for a launch. A lot of projects think we're going to do all our marketing, we're going to get our KOLs on, we're going to, we're going to start. And then two weeks before their launch day, they say, okay, we, let's, let's hire some market makers and get some exchanges on board. If you want a successful launch, you've got to, you've got to plan this out a little bit more. Um, spend some time you know, thinking about what service providers you want, what exchanges are the most appropriate for your user base, including how much you want to pay these exchanges because they, they're, in a, they're a business too. They need to make money and some of them are going to be more appropriate than others. Um, think about you know, what type of liquidity um, you want on that first day and in that first week. What are your users going to demand? D do you need liquidity on decentralized venues or do you want to concentrate it on you know, centralized venues? Make sure that all of the exchanges you get listed at, they all, they're all prepared so that their pipes are running well, withdrawals and... and deposits are frictionless. What you don't want is fractured liquidity, fragmented market, prices trading all over the place across different venues. That's a very, very bad user experience and that's going to result in, in lost users um, and lost potential users as well. So planning out a liquidity program long in advance, I'd say months in advance, and treating it as a very, very important part of your, of your platform, of your project, which differs, I suppose, from, from inequities where to some extent, it doesn't really matter where a stock trades on the market, right? It's largely separate from the company itself. Not always, I mean, if, the, if there's, you know, a capital cliff or, or there's debt funding required. But for the most part, fundamentals are, are different to, to technicals. In crypto, it is one and the same. The value of your project and the kind of future momentum of your project is highly, highly correlated to the health of your token. So, so coming up with a valuable and, and ongoing liquidity um, strategy ahead of time um, pays, pays dividends along the way. And I think okay. yeah. you guys have probably experienced some, yeah. some horror stories along the yeah. way. One of, I mean, one of the most important decisions a project can make is who they work with on the market making side. And as an investor, it's one of the most important decisions they can make and you help them through that process. But a fumbled you know, launch on a token, I mean, that, that could cause ruin for, it can cause an, an enormous amount of growth and it's successful token launch and it can cause a substantial amount of pain and a long duration of that pain trying to get yourself back on your feet as a project if your token launch doesn't go successfully. So yeah, it's, a, it's an opportunity, it's a real catalyst for growth is yes. a token launch, but you only get one. Yeah. So if, you, mean, you, if you fumble it, you've, you've missed a big opportunity. So liquidity, there. plan ahead and just make sure Find you Find the right service them. providers, plan an actual strategy. It's not just let's get listed on this exchange oh, so yeah. we can have a live token. So not, not an fragmented ideal strategy. liquidity as well. Yeah, plan, plan out your listings, plan out your service providers, plan out your, your overall liquidity strategy with market makers is, um, 
you know, a really, really valuable decision for most projects. Very bullish on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, okay, so I was at ETH Denver last month, and there's just so many projects going on right now. Um, there's lots of hype around Bitcoin L2, so like BOB built on Bitcoin, there's like Babylon, and then when you look over to ABSs, this whole restaking narrative is huge. So as a VC, especially an early stage VC, what kind of characteristics or, or points are you looking out for when you're looking at investing in these pro token projects and what themes are you actually seeing right now? So, I mean, from when we started in, and I started in 2017, it's always been identifying a theme early and being a bit contrarian. So like right now, I mean, if you had a liquid restaking protocol or if you have a, you know, a Bitcoin L2 and there's no shortage of capital looking to fund you, um, it's getting to a saturation point where you need to start really showing differentiation. Um, like for example, anything in the Bitcoin world, my, my first question is, who is your strategic partner? Because if you don't have a substantial source of Bitcoin value to allocate, you don't really have anything. You have a product that's gonna float into a market where it's primarily commoditized and it's gonna be hard for you to really get any type of usage or value out of that. So I think the other side of things, particularly in the early stage venture space, because you're trying to identify projects early at reasonable valuations that you think will you know, accelerate pretty dramatically over time, you have to go to undercapitalized regions, undercapitalized sectors. Um, and so my, my partner in Neoclassic, Steve Lee, has been in you know, Asia for the last seven weeks, be there for another two, and you know, he's, he's, a, he's a local. He's a local in Tokyo and, and, and Seoul. He speaks fluent Korean, Japanese. He's worked across those regions in Singapore. He's someone who can act very locally, which is important in those areas, particularly because, I mean, the, the largest denominated you know, currency uh, trading pair is the Korean one right now. Mm -hmm. And the large, largest user base for a lot of these projects is in Korea, Japan, Southeast Asia. You need to be able to I, operate very locally, speak with them in a particular format, and particularly in Japan, operate in a certain business sense to be able to build a relationship that over the next six months, you're their partner for when they decide to go out and scale. And you're doing that at early stage venture valuations. The other thing, I mean, ETH, you know, what happened in East Denver, I'm not gonna say, this is probably gonna be a good trade, but it's not an investment I would make as an early stage manager, but you look at the valuation of a particular infrastructure project went from a billion dollars at the start of East Denver to three and a half billion at the end of it. And it was financed by the end at three and a half billion dollars. And it's because there's a lot of money. I'm US. on that project, by the way. Yeah, I, so I, I, think it's, I think the project will work. It's just not an early stage venture investment. Yeah. And, you know, again, it's just, there's no shortage of US focused, infrastructure focused dollars to flow into those types of things. And that's great. And if I was running a liquid fund, I would probably side pocket that investment because I think it will work well. Uh, but early stage venture, you have to look at things that are much earlier, take much larger, you know, have much higher conviction yep. um, and be contrarian. Because everything else that's non-contrarian, you're basically, it's relative value. You're looking at a comp group of all tell ones or liquid restaking protocols and you're saying, okay, good team, the right people around it. This is, tra this is coming at me at three and a half billion if it, sort of fills, closes the gap to the next player, the public markets, it's a 2x, 3x. And you could trade that, but that's not early stage vesting. Okay, so be contrarian, so don't buy an index. Go to undercapitalized sectors and regions, and that's where you're gonna find value. Okay, and um, for, this one's for Matt. So Bitcoin ETFs, they've seen unprecedented inflows. So 60 billion the last time I checked in AUM. And uh, HODL's also been approved as one of those. Uh, there's a lot of chatter around Ethereum, spot Bitcoin ETF approvals, etc., and all that. But outside of that, there's the world of ETFs is so much larger. I mean, like all of us come back from tripod backgrounds, so we know, you know, things like thematic ETFs are a thing too. Like, what other kind of projects or innovations are Vanek looking at at the moment? So we have filed for a spot Ethereum ETF in the US, and we're first in line to likely be rejected on 
May 23rd, uh, and the reason why we think we'll be rejected is because we haven't had the usual uh, interactions with the SEC that precede an approval. Uh, so I'm, I'm very happy to see the price of gold rallying because you know about a third of our assets are in gold. So the higher gold goes, the greater the chance that Jan Van Eck will sue the SEC after we get rejected because he'll be flush and feeling confident. So please keep uh, buying gold. Uh, and I, I did a fireside with Brian Brooks last month, and he said, if the Ethereum ETF is approved before the election, I will eat your hat. Uh, so, we're, you know, it's, it's hard to feel optimistic about that. Um, in Europe, however, we, you know, we have a spot, Ethereum, ETN, about 100 million in assets, VETH uh, is the ticker, and we just added staking to that product. So ETP buyers in Europe will get some income from uh, our Ethereum staking efforts. Um, I've noticed our competitors in the U.S. added Ethereum staking to their ETF filings in the U.S. I think that's trolling us uh, because I, we don't see the regulations as allowing for staking. In Europe, there's more uh, leeway given to the PM to uh, manage the liquidity that ETPs are supposed to provide, but in the U.S. it's stricter. You really have to provide continuous liquidity, and it's, it, we don't think staking will pass. So. Uh, Unlikely to be other uh, ETF products in the U.S. There needs to be futures markets on these. I had dinner with the guy at the CME in charge of that. He's like, I'm not doing anything until the election or after. So a little chance that there'll be Solana futures, as an example, that could give us a Solana ETF. Uh, so we're not really about new products. We're about executing on our existing products. We have two uh, private funds, hedge funds, essentially. Most folks don't even know because they're not available to retail investors uh, because of SEC regulations. But both of those uh, liquid token funds beat Bitcoin after fees last year. So we think we have the right mix of um, you know, a thesis-driven approach, risk management, and you know, 365, 24-7 trading to take advantage of uh, alpha opportunities that we think some VCs might miss, frankly, because they've rightly got their eye on the illiquid and earlier stage opportunities. Are they active funds? Yeah. So secondary, you, you see more opportunity around like secondary market kind of tokens? Uh, see more opportunity around... I f I feel like the early allocators into crypto in the U.S., the institutions, they got their exposure through venture. That's where it fit in the allocation matrix. And those funds have, have grown up, but they haven't returned DPI. They're not returning capital. Uh, I saw an incredible chart. The ratio of DPI to assets raised for U.S. VCs, it's at an all-time low. Uh, so we're trying to offer a different experience. Quarterly liquidity, take your money out when you want to. Uh, and my fund, the staking alone is covering the expense ratio. Um, and that's just through like disciplined staking, unstaking, a lot of clicking. Uh, but that experience of quarterly liquidity versus the VC model, oh, let me take your money for five years, lock it up, make a bunch of small bets, maybe double down on the winners. Uh, yeah, we think there's a better opportunity uh, in the liquid markets. Valuations are more attractive, liquidity is more attractive, uh, and the risk management and concentrated approach uh, can provide attractive returns. All right, and going back to market cycles, so we've all been through peaks and troughs and expansionary, recessionary kind of periods. Um, wrote my paper, economic paper, back in 2009, during the GFC, et cetera. So being such seasoned, not that it's showing an age or anything, <laughs> investors, um, what kind of lessons have you guys learned from seeing different market cycles and what would you have done differently if, you know, you could turn back time? I don't know. When I, I started at Goldman two weeks before Lehman collapsed and my, the, the thing I would have changed is when I saw the Occupy Wall Street folks outside our office, I probably should have bought Bitcoin the second I heard about it. Um, I didn't recognize. I was more angry that I was working, you know, 18 hour days and people were outside midday just yelling at us and throwing stuff at the windows and but that was a movement right it was a movement against the financial system and i i think was maybe too young to understand at that point in time what it actually meant um the other thing is just 
just follow liquidity. I mean, when we were in a zero, you know, zero interest rate environment for as long as we were, just own assets. I mean, it's, it's, it actually, you said lower turnover. It actually takes a lot of discipline and work to not trade out of positions. Like, it is, it is incredibly uh, difficult to do. Um, and so anyone, you know, the world of crypto fund managers, it's rare that you have someone with lower turnover because you get these substantial returns and in your head you say, okay, this has to mean revert. But there's a much larger structural play at work that I think I recognize, obviously, which is the reason I left Goldman in 2017, but I would say looking back in time, I've kind of used this as my overarching thesis of, of, of all market cycles, which is liquidity dictates everything and effectively rates dictate everything. And then within that, you can make your allocations. And so, you know, the, 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 the world of crypto make, made a lot more sense for me later on in my career um, once I understood the asset itself. And then I always say, I mean, even from my perspective, I came into the market because I thought it was a very tradable market. I thought there was alpha to be had. And when we launched the hedge fund, that made sense to me. And then once I was in there, I'm, I'm, you know, over the years, I'm like, we have these great conviction bets, and yet we keep trading out of them constantly. And that's why when we launched, you know, Neo Classic, I said, Steve and I said, we need to focus on early stage high conviction bets. And that might actually be in public assets. We would structure, you know, a public deal, but I think you're doing it right. I think this concentrated longer term orientation with lower turnover is one of the hardest things to do. If you're, but if you're able to do it, it works out well. Yeah, there's this saying, uh, don't just do something, sit there. Uh, so that, I think that's, if, if you miss the best 15 days of the year in crypto, you're negative every single year. So, like, why put yourself through that, right? And the total return from, from staking ETH uh, since the merge, if you've outperformed by like 1,500 basis points holding ETH, right? So, lower turnover, high conviction, uh, that's the model that, that we're trying to run. Less tax lots. Huh? Less tax lots. Yeah. yeah. Well, in Dubai, it doesn't matter, but in the don't, States, it certainly does. <laughs> don't try and trade the market, basically. Hoddle. Hoddle. Mm, exactly. And Ben, what about you? Yeah, we're a market neutral fund, so we don't, we don't really take, take directional views. We leave that to the professionals over here. Uh, I can speak from, from personally, I, got, I think I've got a few years on you guys. So I was um, seven years into my career when, um, when you were starting, Mike. And, um, we had, we, the firm that I was at, it was a market neutral firm, but we did have a few, a few kind of, we were a vol trading firm, so we had a few vol positions, um, and we over traded it, for sure. Like, sometimes you've got the right position, you just gotta sit there, man. You just gotta, you just gotta recognize, I'm in the right position here, I'm either adding to my position, or I'm gonna sit there. And the, like, when the liquidity's going one way, it, it, it's, a, it's, like a, it's like a freight train. Don't, just don't get in the way of it. Either, either hack out of a losing position or, or sit on, on a winning position. I'd say I probably personally did a poor job when, um, yeah, from what, 2012, was it? 2012 through till 2020, it was just liquidity, liquidity, and then you had the little brief hiccup around, around COVID, and then even more liquidity thereafter. Overtraded. Um, it always feels good, right? It always feels good to like be in a good trade, to make some money and say, yeah, okay, that, that's, that's enough, I've hit my target. But you need to set yourself moving targets. You need to recognize, you know, the tailwind is, is gonna be a lot stronger than your ability to pick short-term highs and lows. Uh, as a market neutral fund, we, uh, market neutral trading firm, we don't, we don't tend to, to try to do that, but we do make some small little decision making, you know, along the way. And um, certainly I'm, I'm trying to, trying to trade less, because I think it's, I think we all over trade. Um, and, and the alpha, like I said, the alpha you're gonna get from picking short term highs is, short term highs and lows is probably gonna be lower than just recognizing when you're in the right position and, and sticking to it. Yeah, definitely. And um, in terms of the next six to 12 months, there's, there's quite a few macro factors coming up. There's like US elections, there's potential rate cuts um, on the cards. What, uh, what do you guys think about these factors? Like, what do you think is actually going to drive this crypto cycle uh, in the, this next six to 12 month period? Maybe Mike? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I mean it's like, a, you know, all, all economists are right 50% of the time, right? That's the, the old demo. I, I mean, it, 
again, I said it previously, I think liquidity and ultimately rage drives all things. So I think if there's a vacuum of capital out of the system, it's going to come out of every orifice of capital markets. And our markets are deep, but they're not that deep. And so, you know, there's gap risk in basically every asset outside of Bitcoin and maybe ETH. So that can also gap higher, right? So we can, if, if all of a sudden, you know, infra inflation prints much lower, um, and we have a, you know, a chance at having a few cuts again this year, which is the opposite of the view that was, or that's Not currently happening. happening. Do you think um, that's likely? Like a, a few no, uh, no. I, I think we let, I think we unleashed a force, a wave of capital that's going to be very difficult to pull back in, and I think that's going to continue to be seen through inflation. I don't know how long it takes for markets to self-correct. In that time, I think crypto can work because we're at this point in a, you know, if, if you if you dumb it down, we're in this four-year cycle. And this is that cycle for us. And so I think in an, in an unknown environment, if we're not in full on risk off, you know, rates higher, we're probably going to trend higher in crypto. There's probably going to be some interesting opportunities. The, the other side of it is, will market liquidity come back in the market? I think that's important, even on the venture side, because ultimately what you said about DPI, the reason crypto venture makes so much sense is because of the velocity of token liquidity. And so if you have the ability to take, you know, if, if, if a successful trade or successful investment works out, you put a million bucks into a deal, it trades at 50X and you get 20% liquidity on that asset over, you know, at that token generation or over some time frame, you need market liquidity to trade out of that. Thank you, market makers. Um, and if that, if the market doesn't allow for that level of liquidity, it doesn't allow for the velocity of capital and the expansion yeah. of the industry. So yeah. um, I guess all that to say, I don't know what happens with the, you know, on the macro side of things. I don't think anyone actually knows. Um, but if we sort of stay in this phase of, I, I'm glad we corrected from saying four cuts to saying maybe one, because I think that was overdone um, and the market needed to come back. Uh, but if we're in this chop in the macro world, I think crypto works well. We're just, I mean, it's, it's the right part of the cycle for us. And yes. I think this unknown leads people to a barbell approach generally. So you have, I mean, even my own portfolio, I have a, a good chunk in, you know, what I consider to be very safe assets and obviously a good chunk in crypto. And that is a nice, you know. Yeah, I mean, we came into the year saying no cuts. Wage inflation is still four and a half percent in the U.S. So it's, uh, it's very hard to cut. And that was not our thesis for this year. Our thesis is the election cycle record percentage of global citizens voting in elections this year. So far, they've all gone to the pro-crypto candidate. Uh, and then November is just going to be an enormous event. And I think Bitcoin's going to rally either way because of the certainty that the two nominees are the most fiscally profligate uh, presidents in US history in, in peacetime, right? So we're going to look back on this period of 7% deficits during an economic boom, the same way we look back at 1% interest rates during COVID as completely maniacal and unsustainable. And the election will catalyze some type of reckoning. We usually only deal with big issues in the US in the year after a presidential election, 2025. Uh, Social Security is going to go bust in 2023. So if we don't do it in 2025, 2029 is too late. And that's why politics are such a big deal. And my personal view, state, nation state adoption of Bitcoin is what will drive this cycle. Right. So there's five countries mining Bitcoin for their own account that will grow and the election will either way will catalyze the rest of the world to deal with it because yeah. we're not elections. OK. And Ben? I think, I mean, we're running out of time. I'd, I'd probably echo what, what you guys have said and yeah. add that retail's not really participating yet. Like, yeah. it, it just feels there's, there's still no retail participation. We're at all-time highs, and it hasn't even started. The, the fly in the ointment is wage inflation, um, I would say. A lot stronger and seemingly a lot more persistent. Probably in a happy spot where they where the Fed doesn't have to raise, they'll it'll, it'll be a high bar for them to go and to go and raise. I've seen yeah. some kind of non-consensus views this past week that actually the next move is going to be up, not down. Um, well, I, I don't I don't necessarily buy into that view. I think, but I think we might be waiting longer for for the shift down. But it it may not matter. I mean, we saw. I mean, U.S. equities apart aside from the last week, U.S. equities are up 25 percent since October. And the 10 years gone up since, since, since then. Yeah. So no one cares about valuations anymore. 
<laughs> yeah, look, it's, it's all about liquidity and, cool. and, evident, and flows. And evidently, yeah. there's, there's you know, stronger flows and right. stronger flows than, than what we're priced in. And I, I think, aside from a real rate surprise on the upside, it just the trend does seem to, to appear that all it's right. going to go higher. So the Fed and elections, look out for those macro factors. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That's the end of the session.